see segmenting questions you asked, retail, wholesale, where the profitability lines are, the family offices, intergenerational, intergenerational, intergenerational wealth, put my teeth back in, and I guess that non-advised client wealth, if someone sells a service station or a, a family business and wants a company, so it's a whole different market to think about. Right, now turn all that on its head, we're going to think about another part of your business which does my head in, that's the efficient, inefficiency of software to develop financial plans. The amazing, the, who, who remembers VisiPlan? Old people in the room? Then out came XPlan, Mark 1, or XPlan Mark 50, I think, still XPlan. And look, nothing wrong with XPlan, we, we use it through a lot of our businesses, but certainly to dominant play in the marketplace. And I must get smashed around every day on that question as well, but why is it taking me so long to get stuff out? Why is it so inefficient? Why have I, and it's just something that the industry hasn't really come to terms with. All this fantastic technology and managed accounts, we still don't have stuff that fixes up that advice process. But Andrew from Dash, CEO of Dash for Wealth02 and Raw, is going to tell us about how some of your ideas may fix that problem. So, Andy, take it away. Thanks, Mike. Just looking for the clicker. Is this it? Yep. Great. All right, Dash, here we go. So, if you guys don't know who we are, that's fair enough, although Mike just stole some, can I? Yes, Mike just stole some, uh, my thunder just there, so we'll talk about that later. Um, the Dash is the combined entity of actually three businesses, but two that are advisor facing. The two are Raw Financial Planning Software and uh, Wealth02, which is a, uh, was a, was and is a boutique managed account platform, which is why we are uh, so happy to be here with, with Toby and IMAP. So we, we live in this managed account space all the time. So I'm going to cover off uh, in a little bit more detail why we came together. Uh, but the chunk of the presentation today is going to be around, you know, everyone is talking about cost to serve. You spoke about profitability just a second ago about which client segment. So it's clearly a hot topic. Uh, when we were down in Melbourne, someone ran up to me and said, can you please talk about cost to serve? So that feels good just before you do a presentation that's on your topic. Also, then Toby gave me bad news that as an MDA provider, they're going to go, the cost of those are going to go up 130% this year. Is that right? Did I get that right, Toby? Uh, Close enough. Yeah. They're going up, right? It's all going up. So profitability is a concern for you and for me. So we're going to cover that off uh, as we go through. Uh, and then finally, we're going to talk about some of the hidden costs that we don't ever talk about uh, in, fi in financial planning businesses. That's something that we is really passionate to me and something we're going to be tackling at Dash. So firstly, why did we come together uh, and why did we choose, why did, from the Wealth of Two perspective, why did we choose Raw? So then when you sit at board level, so to tell the story, you sit there with board and you go, well, how are we going to grow? There's somewhere between 18 and 23 platforms out in the industry already. Um, Wealth02 is one of the fastest growing platforms in, in history, the fastest going through one and two billion and three billion as well. Um, but does the world need another platform? So you've got a couple of options. You go, well, do we just go and buy another platform and it's a race to scale? We can do that. We can do that. Everyone's doing that. We love that uh, in the platform side of things. Or do we look at just take a step back from the industry and go, what is it that we're trying to achieve and who are we serving? Uh, and our view came to that we feel like with the balance sheets that platform have and the business model they have, we can be more helpful to advisors than we have been historically. Uh, and we can reach deeper into platforms, uh, sorry, advisors' practices and be more helpful. So one of the big stats that we have, and I think someone mentioned they had three platforms just this afternoon in the last session, right, that the average practice has 2.9 platforms in every, uh, in, in, in every platform, so if you, in every practice. So if you have three of any tech, if you, just, if, if you came from a different industry and you asked the question, if you have three of any individual tech that do largely the same thing in your practice, is that providing a solution at all, right? It's pretty difficult legislation aside, of course, there's best interest duty and legacy, you're smiling about that. You were like, what about best interest duty? Right, we get it. But still, does it make sense, right? And I think the answer is no. So we decided we would come at, the, at, at this a completely different angle. So when we scanned the marketplace, we were very proud of the fact that we were one of the few platforms up there that have a net promoter score in the positive, right? So Hub Net Wealth uh, and Wealth02, throw a hanky over them, net promoter score, 
that's good. So then we go, okay, if we're going to do the software thing, and we're going to create an integrated experience between financial planning software and a platform, who would you choose, right? So anyone with any market share, so everyone you guys seem to hate, right? So we can't do that. We can't, we can't do that because it's heavily, heavily in the red, as you can see there. Platform Plus is, is owned by a dealer group and is, is a closed shop, as far as I understand it. Fin365 is a CRM. The only one in that top bracket is the one that came second there is Raw, and they have a 52 net promoter score, which is very high, and they're a comprehensive shop that's doing really cool stuff. They're also in a similar background, APIs, brand new tech. All right, let's get together. They're good guys, which should have come first, but that was a secondary sort of option, secondary consideration. And so then we merged, and so that's what we've got. And so now we have everything that we need to provide an end-to-end -end wealth management solution that can go from online fact find through to CRM, through to cash flow modeling that doesn't rely on a spreadsheet, right? That you don't have to do all the trial and error stuff. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Through to portfolio construction, digital SOA. So the last high net worth client in Melbourne, we had a different high net worth practice doing the presentation before, and they were so upset their SOAs that they were actually spending time to do the SOA and then do a PowerPoint of the SOA so they didn't have to show the SOA. Like this is the stuff that we are just used to dealing with now because we've, the tech has been so bad for so long. I think we're, we're kind of immune to it. So digital SOAs that can cover anything. Imagine that, we're just, record, just uploading your SOA and you've got something to present and then fully integrated into a platform. So were any of you in the room when they decided that platforms and your financial planning software should not ever speak, right? Did any of you guys say, no, 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 I want to rekey everything because I just need to make sure that we are type, our um, typing speed is up to scratch, or like, what, what is that, right? What, is, that, is that one of those things that have just came to pass, again, that we've gotten used to, or is there any value in it? We're, gonna, we're challenging the fact that there's definitely no value in that. That's our point. Okay, so then how does this come to, uh, from a technology perspective, what is the relationship between tech and cost to serve? Well, before we get there, one of the things that really, really frustrates me, not necessarily Dash, but prior to Limited, um, is that whenever we talk about cost to serve, we get trotted out stuff like this. So this is KPMG, they did a white paper. In this whole presentation, I'm just gonna present you other people's ideas, because it makes me seem smarter and less uh, biased, so this is the first of a few. So KPMG here have said this is the cost on average, 5335, so not a high net worth client, but an average sort of client, up to a million or up to the cap. But the amount they want to charge is 3660. So clearly it's a loss leader just to run the comprehensive financial planning process, right? And so we all accept that and then blame, it's the legislation, right? And it's an ASIC. So there's two things about that is one, A, ASIC is slow to move. B, we have 13 different organizations for an 18,000 uh, planner uh, community. So we're not gonna lobby this anytime soon and get it won, right? It's just not gonna happen. So what else can we look at in our practice? We can't just keep moaning about ASIC. We are not gonna get that done. What, we've gotta look inward. And what I think is, I think technology and platforms Scott free from analysis from this conversation. We're really, an efficiency conversation. Surely this is software led, right? So this is what we're. This is the challenge that we are that we're putting to ourselves and helping our clients with, which we'll talk to you uh, about at the end. I don't like they called it a troubled sector as well. That kind of pissed me off. Um, so here's our friends at Iris, and I will say our friends because something I, I I got some feedback from my Melbourne presentation that was unclear is that we're going end to end, but one thing that they do in the States very well that we don't really ever do well here, and everybody, every planner here is gonna be super cynical about it when I say it, but it works if you do it properly. So in the States, every, the software companies will make their bets, right? They'll say, we're good at this module, this module, this module, this module, and we want you to use our modules. Look at Salesforce, even zero out of the New Zealand, right? They want you to use all their modules, that's where they make all their money, but, they, if you want to get a best of breed partner, you can plug in, right? And so we call that an advice marketplace. At board level, we call that future-proofing your software business, right? Because we can't be the best at everything ever, 
right? We understand that. If there's some kid that comes up with an app that revolutionizes portfolio management and knocks out one of our modules, we can't lose the whole business. We want to plug that in. We want to manage the integration. We want to keep all our clients and we want to keep moving on with our business. So we are very serious about that, where we integrate with best of breed partners, including Iris's X-Plan. Um, from a modeling perspective and a CRM perspective. So anyway, so when I say our, our friends at Iris, well, I'm, not, I'm not being smug, this is actually, this is actually the truth. Um, and how we're planning on changing, changing the landscape a little bit. So there's a couple of pieces here. They did a white paper. Uh, it's like 18 pages or so. Uh, and where they actually interviewed their top 10% of their clients. So these are their best users, right, that we're talking about. These are people that are floundering around and never got it working or didn't invest. And there's some really staggering stuff that comes out here. The first is that I like, on the bottom right, is really hard to ignore, 14.6 hours to do an SOA, right? The way I work during my day, that would probably take me a week with the amount of phone calls or into lunches that I like to take and how much I drink, right? So that's just a staggering amount of time for a top 10%. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit. Then we've got, 2.3, sorry, 2.3, we wish, 2 to 3, platform technology, so platform being overused there, but that's basically software packages to produce advice documents. So this isn't your platforms that I spoke about where you guys also have three. You have three others just to get the job done before they can get onto one of the three platforms that we're using, right? So again, that's, we've got six pieces of software doing the same thing, same process that we're running the whole time for similar clients, for similar segments. segments. We're being disciplined about that, but seemingly we're, we're, we're not helping you be disciplined on this front. Uh, and then the other part that, just as an aside, is that 12.9K per FTE on tech is a big old number for some of the practices to carry around. So how does this play out? Again. If people, a lot of people take photos of slides, don't take a photo of this slide, this slide sucks, but it's supposed to suck for a reason, right? The reason this one is up here is because, A, this is the FPA's version of the comprehensive financial advice process, so we didn't come up with this, this is me leveraging other people's ideas, but also the fact that this has never changed. In about 23 years I've been in this industry, this has been the same, right? So we should all know that, so if you take a photo of this, you should have a good hard look at yourselves, right? And then, but the really part, the one interesting component of it is how many handoffs in your practices occur to get the job done, right? So the bottom, if you can't read it is, sorry, the top, if you can't read it, is the client, right? Everyone else, all those handoffs is internal in there. And if you're muddling, if, you, if we're muddling around between six different platforms and handing off between two, two to three different teams within the practice, then clearly this is gonna take a long time and it's gonna be painful. There's gonna be mistakes, there's gonna be risk and the costs of serve are gonna go up. So any investment that is made in handing off smoothly within your teams and clearly technology has a role to play there, just ignore everything else. If you can just handle those handoffs properly without word and without mistakes and without Chinese whispers, you're gonna be a better business overnight. Uh, but clearly there's, there's opportunities here for, for, better for better efficiency and some improvement. So as we, we'll summarize this and move this pretty quickly. So this is a better slide. Um, this is the, if we break down the FPA, the FPA uh, process and we incorporate the hours that Iris have got in here, you can see that about two and a half, 2.25 hours for the initial meeting, the strategy briefing, strategy appointment, and the SOA generation is the crux of it, right? This is where you can make all of your efficiency gains to make your onboarding profitable again. Um, three hours for the briefing, one and a half hours for the SOA generation, nine and a half for modeling, right? Just for modeling. And I'll touch on why that's painful or how we can improve that later. But as an old power planning nerd, so I ran a power planning business called Outplan feels like forever, like two, early 2000s, uh, mid 2000s, right? And we used to uh, center around private banks, right? Because they could pay and they had the most complex, uh, the most complex plans, but we loved it. It was a bit of a stitch up because the most complex plans people always think are family trusts and SMSFs, but they're not, they're just investment 
SLAs, right? They're easy. That's not where you're going to make your time up. The most painful ones, and we did thousands upon thousands, are a retiree, right, with about a million bucks who has plans for their retirement, right? They're the ones that are a complete, uh, are always the hardest ones because you've got a certain finite amount of money and you've got to work on effectively Iris X plans. X tools is a spreadsheet at the back, like technology-wise, that is a spreadsheet, and you have to like trial and error your way, like you're using a calculator. If I contribute this much back here, what will I have here to optimize it? And that can take hours upon hours for a client that would probably be embarrassed that, to understand how much you spent on getting that model right, which you also know after this week, it's all wrong, right? There's nowhere near that it's right, but it's gotta be done. So technology, believe me when I say, if you're, if you're doing all the maths engines, technology has gone a long way. We can do the maths for you. You can just drag things down. But we'll touch on that in a little bit. And then finally, the implementation at 0.75 hours of presentation, I think is a little bit light, but one and a half hours on implementation typically across the teams is something that we can work on as well if we can integrate that platform into the game. So if we summarize it, the major costs are the getting the data, right? So if you can have integrated solutions out there like Astute Wheel, which is built on technology of ours, right? We call Highlighter. So we've actually the tech provider behind Astute Wheel. They're good friends of ours. You send that out, it comes into us, into Dash seamlessly. One of the benefits for that is this client, this clients are doing their own data entry, right? Perfect. So that's going to help from a cost to serve perspective. Modeling we've spoken about. SOA generation is we've spoken about. Not least of which where you get the SOA wrong, right? Where if you actually go through the 14.86 hours and then you make a mistake, what happens then, particularly in a mistake that, if, that, that affects the modeling, you have to send that back into the back office, right? It's a huge pain, another potential couple of weeks, customer service is poor. So SOA generation, SOA presentation, and advice implementation. So what we've done then is we're trying to work up the costs of that FPA process, and we've taken the hours from uh, the IRIS white paper, and we've really just reverse engineered the costs across the, across the streams, the train lines, into the process. So we haven't come up with these numbers. If these look high or low, it's for the purposes of the analysis. We're just trying to make it fit that 5336 and the, uh, that it's actually costing via the FPA presentation. So this is what it looks like. Very similar to the timing, you can see we're spending almost 615 bucks initially, 400 bucks in the presentation and the presentation and implementation, but really the SOA generation is killing everybody, right? And even if you outsource power planning, and I used to pitch that all the time, but lived that, there's costs in there as well. You've got to brief it, you've got to get it. Often there's mistakes, you've got to go back around. If you're time billing yourself, there's costs no matter which way you do it. So don't let software vendors tell you that there's not an easier way to do. Go. There's 5335 is the cost there, but for all of our chat, what should software be doing? Spoken about integrated, integrated front office, feel free, feel free to share your data entry with your clients. Do that. No one wants to do that sort of data entry. If they will do it, let them do it. Model optimizer versus trial and error. So I spoke about trial and error. If we have the algorithms now in 2022, if we have Facebook that can serve up ads based on what you clicked on, I can tell you we can run a TTR maths engine and just drag that down and the thing will go done. Right? Here's how you optimize the strategy. So we won't pick the strategy. You guys meet the clients. You pick the strategy. Drag it down. Let us do the maths. Costs out. Right? So that's what software should be doing. Templates that actually work. I love this one. This is actually how power planning businesses are born because people f invest in templates once. And then it sort of drags on. No one wants to update it, right? Like the coding updates or the budget changes or the software has release after release after release. Do I want to spend another 20 grand on updating my templates? Absolutely, I don't. Do you know what we'll do is we'll just use Word, right? We'll just use Word and we'll just use Word templates. It's more rekeying, more costs, and you just sort of move on. We've moved on past that. Digital statement of advice. Now, I've mentioned the costs going back into the back office. If you have a digital, has anyone gone to AFCA? Is anyone brave enough to actually put their hands up or fix or whatever they call it? I won't, I won't embarrass anyone, right? But one of the biggest problems they have, well, one of the, the ones where advisors get held up, 
that where they actually get prosecuted is where there's been a, either a mistake in the plan or a client has suggested they'd never understood what was in that plan or they're just in the wrong risk profile, right? They account for about 65% of everything that, that goes against the advisor. If you have a digital advice, and it's software where you're presenting to, you can actually time every single, t the amount of time you spend in every section, right? You can t time everything. So if they come back and go, I didn't understand that. So on this date, we spent 13 and a half minutes discussing just this one point. And you can have hard stops where sign this one bit, otherwise we can't continue, right? And it's just on the software, click this, click this. So they go through. So if you're in, if you're in arbitration, um, you can actually have some kit to defend yourself with. With Word, where there's little signatures and this, that, and the other, you guys are nude in front of these guys, hoping that it's all gonna work. So this needs to change from a risk perspective. Also, if you make mistakes or they wanna update something, it just updates, right? So again, you don't have version control issues that people can rely on if they wanna make a complaint against you. And then finally, integrate that platform. If you've entered the, if a client's entered their data once, it's the same data, you definitely don't have to touch that twice. So get that into the platform. And so then what are our clients achieving from a cost to serve? Well, across the board, the whole process, it looks like this. Oh, I didn't click one. There we go, that's the summary, right? So all of a sudden, we've gone from 3660 to comparison, compare it with 5335, and now we've changed that to 2918. So just by having a look at and utilizing software that looks and feels more like 2022, you can, you can make profit. You're not gonna make a business of just doing like retail industry fund onboarding clearly, but there's no reason why you can't take margin on the onboarding process of a new client, comprehensive advice process. Okay, so then there's some hidden costs that I feel like we never talk about as well in the practice. So one of the big limitations in any consulting business, and I've run one, uh, and you guys are effectively running one, is the fact that if your advisors aren't in the room, they, well, they can only be in one room at one time, right? So there's just an element of scalability when you go to build this asset and ultimately sell it on, is how do you be in more rooms delivering your advice more regularly, right? How could you possibly do that? There's only one of you. Well, one of the things where we've built for a couple, of, um, a couple of clients that are using heavily now, particularly for times like this when they're rebalancing their MDAs or their internal SMAs, is put it in a digital document. You can time the client how often they're in there, right? You can put the little hard and soft features on there so that they can go through it and say, yes, I understood it. But it can be you, that, just look at that blonde woman and that could be you, that could be you, explaining what's going on with your managed account or what's going on with your investments. And the research has shown, not from this country, because we don't do this stuff, global research where they use technology, right? Well, the research has shown that clients, when it comes to the end of the year when they're fee paying, do not distinguish when they sign up, re-sign up for things, or re-up it, they call it in the US, between digital delivery by you and Zoom or Zoom delivery by you, or if face-to-face, -face. thank you, I was struggling on that. They don't distinguish between that, right? They, you that we do, because we feel like we're building a relationship, but when it comes to fees, they don't. So you could potentially, in a week like this, pump out a change where you're going to, or hopefully last week, you're going more to cash, pump it out, send it out. They can get you explaining what's going on, push it all back, changes happen on the platform, and you don't have to actually do that 150 times. So are we lacking scale? Probably. Uh, technology today doesn't help. The other thing that I, I personally like to attack, and I will diverse, divorce my views here from of that of Dash Proprietary Limited because I hate benchmarks, and it's a dangerous thing to say in a room like this because we live by it, but I don't think there's ever been a client that's walked down the ro road going, geez, I love how I'm performing versus the benchmark, or I wonder what my benchmark is doing versus me, like I'm kicking it, no one's talking about that in the pubs that I go to at least. They're talking about their life. We don't have the software to deal with that, so we don't like talking about the lives. Well, we, we talk about the lives, we don't show anything about their lives. We're just busy or either on offense or defense versus the benchmark, and that has to, has to change. And look, we have a benchmark on our client portal and it stings, right? It stings me every day, so I'm not, we're, but what we want to do is this. 
We want to be able to, and we have, so if you go through that process, right, if you go through that process, fact find, their clients are keying in their own goals. Are they keying in their own goals? Yes. Are they selecting a benchmark for the Morningstar diversified? No, they're not, right? So you got your goals in there. Then you do the SOA. Is there goals in there? Yep, cool. Goals in the modeling, goals in the SOA. And oh, cool, they're going to assign that. My platform, what happens? Goals? No, not really. No, no, we're interested in goals. Now we're in benchmark territory and we've got to do that. So we do it too. But we're going to try to change this because we have everything in the one tech stack. So why can't we just slide the same goals through from the Archer modeling tool and the SO that appears on the SOA that just goes straight through onto the client portal? Like if they put it in and you did the advice, it should be the center of your world, right? Everything else is us just kind of falling in love with ourselves as an industry, I think. Um, so, but to do that, you've got to have a whole client portal to tra of to the client portal to track the whole of client wealth. So you've got to have debt, you've got to have credit cards, you've got to have all the expenses, you've got to have any industry funds. There can be no gaps, right? So we've got we've partnered with MoneySoft. We've got all their plumbing. We're plumbing plumbing that straight in. We'll build our own screens because we want it to look like that. But now you've got software slash platform tracking everything, our data live, and anything else you've got. But the client, in a week like this, can walk around and go, what has happened to my life? And if you've never seen goals, if you've never seen performance change versus a goal, you've only seen it versus benchmarks, you, what you will know if you've seen it is that maybe their future retirement is, or their current retirement has gone down from $102,000 a year to 98. Behaviorally, that makes a massive difference with the client. And for you guys, who are left holding the bag, trying to translate this over the phone to people while they ring you with a panic, you've got a tool that you can look at and the client can look at. So the hidden cost we're trying to call out is, are we, is the tech and platform industry just letting you down, making you translate all this nonsense because we can't be bothered dealing with it? Maybe, I think it probably is. Uh, and so then finally, we, uh, we finish up on the holy grail. So, We've got some competitors in the industry, so we're just gonna give you some secrets about how we're gonna do it, right? So already we've doing, um, we're doing all the data transfer from platform to software. But when we, when we started running a pilot, we didn't wanna stop there. Like that's API stuff, that's easy. How do we just trade automatically, right, from the SOA? How do you just make rules so that the execution just happens without anybody having to like manhandle it in between? Now the trick, and you guys will get this, your investment guys, is all the timing differences. So you've got maybe the, you send out the plan or they take the plan home. So you've written it, a couple of days lag, they do the authority to proceed, cut maybe a week lag, and then that gets into your office and you process it. Could be like another two or three weeks. Some of the administrators, super administrators are doing three weeks at the moment for in-specie transfers. Could easily be a month, right? where your advice has gone stale and now you've got to execute it, but everything's gone swimmingly. So how do we deal with that? And then on top of that month, everything that rolls over, if you're consolidating super, they could come in at different times, right? So if you're going to automate all of this stuff, you've got to have rules and you've got to have an understanding. So it's all complex. It was too complex for me, but we spoke to some advisors and they made it really clear, right? So they made it really clear. So there's two use cases. One for outsourcers and one that like a bit of salt and pepper on their, on their investments, right? They like to be a little bit more involved. From the outsource perspective, it's really straightforward. Modeling, that's what our modeling tool looks like. That'll do the maths for you. Modeling, digital advice, click go, and the outsourcers just go straight onto the platform. They don't care about the timing differences. They'll just put it in, pro rata it. As the money comes, it just goes in as per the model, bang. So from a software house perspective, just love that, right? That's just rules. We can deal with that. That's maths. People in my office understand maths. So we can deal with that. So that's one. And then there's really only one other that seems to have been surfaced. And that is one of the salt and pepper. So no change. Modeling, statement of advice. But then we need to surface an order pad because, but the order pad has got to show you show the advisor what the model should have been, right? This is what we want, this is what the software, this is what Dash wants you to do. Do this, it's easy, we've already done the maths for you. So we have gotta do the maths for them, for our clients. But 
We're going to give you the order pad in case you want to fill the managed account asset class by asset class in your own way based on what's going on in the market, which normally seems crazy to me. And then you have a week like this and you're like, yeah, maybe you just do the, I don't know, I don't know what you do now. Like, what would you do now? Maybe we'll just do the defensive stuff and we'll let this run on, right? But the, the trick is what was a very complex problem we've distilled down to two use cases because we went out and spoke to advisors deeply and now it seems like we can, we can deal with 100% of the cases and integrate this, this implementation from advice. So further saving costs and making you guys profitable. If you've got any more use cases, let me know. If they're really hard, we'll, we'll forget we spoke. Um, and so then here we go. This is one of our clients who has actually onboarded everything and taken it all. This is his wording. This is why I stole the holy grail. So this, when we roll this out, this is an advisor who has 250 clients, 125 million, one advisor, right? So that is using tech. One advisor, two support staff, 250 clients, right? Uses their own MDA, uses our MDA, but builds their own models and uses every part of the tech stack. And so that's what you can do. That's, what, that's the level you can manage. The average is about 80 million and about 100 clients, 90 clients typically uh, with advisors. So we're seeing big uptick from that. Uh, so that's the quote from them. So that's it from me, Mike. Thanks, everyone, for time. I'll take some questions. I think I'm right on, right on the button. That's right. Efficiency. Efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Any questions for Andrew? Quick, down the back. Yep. Andrew. Hey, Sir. Um, look, I um, in in the graphics there, you've you've got this graph of the growth of the of the investments and then the drawdown. Now, oh, on the on the benchmark hating yes, one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So so do you do you have software that actually shows what would the re results be if a client was, was say, wanting to be conservative at, a, at an early stage, how that would affect it and, and how, long, how long their retirement income would last? Yes. So we wouldn't do that in the bench, like the, the, the areas benchmarks turn up is typically client portals. We would do that in the modelling because what you would be able to show is multiple scenarios where you can s where you okay. would sit down. So, so what are, what I'm getting at is we we're, the whole industry seems to be predicated on risk profiles. Yeah. Now, most people who've sat down, most people who have thought about it, can see that that's bullshit. Yeah. Having a risk pro having a risk profile when you're age 30 or 40 um, it is is based on volatility. And it's the only measure, the only available measure that people have to, to assess risk. Right. But we all know that a higher volatility portfolio, if well selected over time, will produce a higher peak mm -hmm. and a longer pay down. Yep. Now, most people actually, their investment income or their investment returns are probably greater during the drawdown phase than all of the, because they started from zero or very low, built up, the maximum is at the time of retirement and they still have to get returns afterwards. So, so there are a lot of, there's a lot of very badly structured thought yeah. about all of this. And it just seems to me that with the right kind of, kind of software, you could throw up this is what happens if. And then people can say, well, that's the one I want. <laughs> and they will find out that that's probably different to what they would end up with a, a risk profile. Yeah, so that, from a software perspective, is not hard. What you could even do from a software perspective of a maths engine, and it's really popular in the States where they go through and build their own digitally managed accounts based on their goals, right? So you could even create, rather than a risk profile, you could say these are the goals, potentially multiple goals, and you can create a customised glide path based on your balance, your life, your goals. From a software perspective, it's all rules. We love rules. We're rule followers, right? And math, and just maths engine. So all that stuff can be done. The, the industry has just, risk profiles is a good 
easy way to mass distribute understanding. Uh, uh, we haven't done it here at Dash because when we sp think about spending money, are we going to are we going <laughs> Are we going to build something that is just going to get knocked on its head? In my experience, most things that, that uh, challenge risk profiling as it is does. But we did it at Milliman, and a lot of that A&P stuff that fell over had it. Other questions for, for Andrew? Yeah, One around the corner. Yep. How technical can the modelling go? Yeah. Like, can you include trust, SMSFs, that is um, the risk? Because yeah. I've been told these things about 400 times in my life in yeah. financial planning, yeah. and none of them ever do what they say. Yeah. So what can you I love say it. to me that actually proves this can do? Because we, we've well, got a lot of high net worths, yeah. and uh, it's technical. Yeah, it is. Um, it's the first question I asked, uh, not because I'm skeptical of software, because I've worked in them, but I understand <laughs> there is a lot of modeling tools that just do super contributions, right? But I have a, built a business around doing plans for people like you, and so the, I'm skeptical of things that look good, right? Because everything that looks ugly in software seems to have a big engine. Anything that looks good, they've spent too much time on the front and there's no engine. I've met um, girls like that. <laughs> oh, careful, <laughs> cancelled. Um, uh, <laughs> I've lost my train of thought, Toby. Um, He's talking about John Ryan. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, the thing can do trust and it can do SMSFs and it can do streaming and all that stuff. This stuff never stops, but uh, the Archer tool is built to be used in front of a client and it is being used in front of a client, but it is a built also to generate SOAs and I, you, you just can't do it. Everyone has an SMSF these days, right, at least. so. If you have a family trust, you've got to be able to do it. You can do companies. You can do the whole thing. Now, you're never finished. You'll find a whole... I mean, I've... X-Plant... Ixtors Plus, love them or hate, I've been around for 23 years. There's still stuff you, can't, you have to do workarounds with, right? So you're never finished, yeah, um, but you can do every entity in, in a cash flow modelling sense. Long answer. I should have just said yes. <laughs> other, other questions for Andrew? All right, Mop, you set up a demo sometime in the future and do a live one. Sure. Sure thing. Right, yeah. Is a sale there?